Welcome to the Eye on Annapolis Local Business Spotlight. There are thousands of locally owned businesses in the area, some small and some large. Some you may know and others you don't. But one thing they all have in common is a great story, and we want to share it with you. Join us every Saturday as we talk to the founders, the owners, and the managers of local businesses you have come to know and love, and those you will come to know and love. Now here's your host, John Frenet, with this week's Local Business Spotlight. Well, when I come to the Crownsville Hospital Center, I'm usually here for the food bank, but today I am here with the Blue Ribbon Project and Taylor Piles, who is the executive director and the founder and uh, the brainchild behind an organization uh, that I wish didn't exist, uh, as probably you do. And we wanted to talk about the work that you guys are doing. And the Blue Ribbon Project is an advocacy organization for children that are in the foster care program or that have been abused and survived it, too. Yes, yes. Did I get that right? Yes. Yep. Yep. <laughs> Um, no, so where is your background? Where did you, I mean, you started this thing and when did it start? So I started it back in 2012 and it started initially, and I hate to use the word hobby, but it started as a website um, with resources for adult survivors of abuse. And it sounds bad when I say it, but back then it wasn't really about serving the children that we now serve, but it was um, for adult survivors of abuse. I grew up in foster care in Anne Arundel County. I entered care, I was uh, seven years old and I aged out at the age of uh, 18. So majority of my childhood was spent in foster care here in, in the county. Um, as time went on, I um, started seeing some bad things that were happening to a lot of my foster siblings growing up, uh, a lot of drug overdoses, suicides, and, and things of that nature. So that's that's why I started this website to begin with. Um, and then in 2015, I um, wanted to do a little bit more, and I launched our, our what became our biggest program is uh, Backpacks of Love. And Backpacks of Love, they're... Um, they're backpacks that contain emergency essentials for kids that are going into care. And, and when I say emergency essentials, things like clothing, toothbrush, toothpaste, pajamas, we have a book, a small toy, um, any of those things to get them through the first week or so of, of foster care. And, and the way that program works is uh, we have backpacks that are standing by um, from newborns up to 18 years of age, uh, both male and female. So Department of Social Services, they'll give us a call and they say they've got a placement for a five-year-old girl and a nine-year-old brother that are going into care. And so we grab a backpack for a five-year-old girl and a nine-year-old boy, and we run them right out to them as the kids are earning in the foster home. Uh, the one thing to keep in mind is a lot of these kids don't have anything when they're earning foster care, and the things that they do have are often in a trash bag. It's an emergency situation where they have to get them out. So, Well, my daughter is in, in, in that line of work down in North Carolina, and you're using a nice euphemism as far as when they're placed into, into foster care. And a lot of times, uh, this is a surprise to everybody, right? Yes. I yes. mean, it's... Uh, there has been an investigation, which, you know, you never know there's an investigation until, yeah. <laughs> until you know there's an investigation. <laughs> yes. And at that point, it's, you know, somebody coming into a classroom or somebody coming into a daycare or something like that. And a stranger to a child is saying, hey, you need to come with us. And they're putting them into a vetted caring home temporarily. Yes. And then it can get into adoption and, and, and whatnot there. So this is... Um, you know, interesting. You said you aged out. You were, you know, I say a victim, but you were a, a product of, of the system. But you aged out at eighteen. Yes. And you know, certainly, I know when you adopt a child, it is a, you know, it, it is a family. It is your child and and everything else. But in the foster system, that's not the case at eighteen. So, well, uh, the system has changed since I was in foster care. Now it's twenty one years of age. They can, um, the, the foster youth can elect to leave at the age of eighteen. But if they want to remain in the system and receive support and things like that, they can um, they can remain until they're twenty one. So that age, the age of eighteen, has since changed when it comes to aging out. Um, the one thing that also has changed about the system is when I was a kid in foster care, uh, kids just tend to linger in care. I was moved around a lot. Uh, adoption, I wouldn't say wasn't an option, but it was more of a, they wanted reunification with the family. Um, so I remained in care um, as, as a lot of kids did back then. Uh, now they want a little bit more permanency. So whether it's adoption or staying in the same foster home, um, and also the goal is they don't want really kids to go into foster care. They, they want to keep them with the family. So um, oftentimes they'll temporarily do what's called kinship care. 
and that's when a uh, they go the child goes with grandma, grandpa, or an aunt and uncle, and stays stays kind of within the family. They don't want to take, and rightfully so, they don't want to take kids away from their family. It's so the last thing in the world anybody wants to do. Yes, and provided that you know the child is not in physical danger, and, and that you know maybe a parent can be rehabilitated, or maybe if they're in jail, they can you know serve their time and get out and yes. and stuff like that. Um, and I and I know that you know typically in the past you've heard of. Foster kids, as you said, moving from home to home to home for various reasons. I mean, it could be a uh, a bad kid. It could be just a personality conflict. It could be a bad foster parent that just doesn't get along. Um, were you a bad kid when you were little? Mm, not, I don't think so. No. I, I turned out okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so as as a product of the foster care system, you. Uh, embarked on a career as a police officer, and you have retired from uh, from policing now, probably with a little big smile on your face. Yes, and, yes uh, very happy about that. Uh, put two feet on the ground and get up out of bed <laughs> with a smile and a big sigh to be able to come home without worrying about anything. Uh, are you here full time now? Uh, Pretty close. Yeah, yes and no. Um, I, I keep part time hours, but I, I'm here. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm involved in it somehow 24 seven. So, um, so we start off primarily as a all volunteer organization, including myself. Um, uh, we since hired uh, a couple of part-time employees, um, just because it, things have kind of exploded. We've expanded so much. We're now in 12 counties in Maryland, as well as Baltimore city. So, um, it wasn't something I could do, do myself. Uh, so I have a team of volunteers and, and, and doing that. So I come in and um, basically with no pay work Monday through Friday. And then, and then um, answer emails and do stuff in the evenings. Or if that phone call comes in at, at uh, eight or nine o'clock, sometimes later at night about needing a backpack. Um, just as an example, uh, last night I got a phone call and didn't get home till around nine o'clock, which is and it, it's not super late, but it's kind of out of the ordinary uh, with us. Something I don't want to know, but I mean, how busy are you? Um, we're relatively busy and over, over time we've added more programs. So, um, between all the programs, we do stay fairly busy. We also have what's called a uh, foster closet. That's, uh, we, we've named it mirrors closet. And so, uh, foster kids and families can come in and shop for free in our, in our foster closet and pick out the clothes the and stuff and that the they clothing. want. Yes. Yes. That um, was just launched a couple of years ago. Right? Yes. Yes. And it's named in honor of, uh, Mira Shabra, who, uh, the Shabras were friends of, uh, or our friends and my wife and I, and um, uh, unfortunately, so they had a daughter, Mira, that was uh, five years old at the time, and uh, at around Thanksgiving time, she was diagnosed with, um, or they noticed something was wrong. She was ultimately diagnosed with a rare form of a, a brain cancer called DIPG, um, and within a month, she had passed away. So, always want to do something in her honor, um, so instead of just calling it a foster closet, we call it Mira's Closet. That's cool. That's very cool. I mean, when you say you're you're relatively busy, I mean, you got a, you you get a call, and who do you get your calls from? The police or social services? Uh, typically, or? Department of Social Services. We have gotten them from the police, um, but we uh, it's primarily Department of Social Services. And then they're sitting there saying, "Okay, we've got we've got a, a, a child that is coming in," and the backpacks of love is is the first. I guess, yes. reach out that you do. Yes. yes. And then the other resources that you do offer would come as things settle down a little correct. bit. Correct. That's correct. And, and and again, it just sort of blows my mind that, you know, uh, little Timmy has gone to school and he's got his lunchbox with his peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And he's just anticipating at three o'clock today to get on the bus and go back home. Yeah. Uh, no, you know, no matter what that home life may be, that's, that is where he's going. And all of a sudden, Everything is is upended. Yeah. Uh, yeah. When I when I entered foster care, I was in elementary school. I got called into the administrator's office uh, during lunchtime. Went in there. There was a police officer as well as somebody from the Department of Social Services, and off in the foster care I went. And what I wore to school that day, and this is the big inspiration for Backpacks of Love. What I wore to school that day. Uh, is how I entered foster care. I, I couldn't go home and get the stuff that I needed and all that, so the clothes that I had and uh, is, is how I entered foster care. Um, so it was a while, a while. Literally the clothes on your back? Yes, sir. And that was for, you said, elementary school to 18. So that was a good, probably... Yeah, yeah. Eventually, I mean, I, I, uh, within yeah. the first couple of days, I had to get some clothes. Oh, oh yeah, stuff, yeah, but, yeah. But, but I, mean, I didn't have so, so when you you never never exited out of foster care. Correct. Wow. Why? Why? What happened? Why do you go into foster care? Do we talk about that? Uh, it was uh, physical. Abuse. My mother had some mental health issues, okay. so um, some serious mental health issues. So there was physical abuse that took place uh, in the home. You know, it's it's a godsend that we have organizations and people 
that are looking out for those that uh, can't really look out and advocate for themselves. And it sort of goes through everything in life, uh, certainly in an instance with the foster care. But I mean, just, uh, you know, you go to the hospital with a broken leg and uh, you know, you, you've got you got to fight for it. Yeah. You know, yeah which yeah. is kind of kind of crazy. Um well, blueribbonproject.org is the website, and that does have a, an incredible amount of resources, uh, explains really what you do. But you do have an event that's coming up on Saturday, April 15th, that's and correct. that's your annual open house and family uh, fun day. <laughs> right. I was, here, I was here, not last year, well you, well, you haven't had it for a couple of years. Yeah, because of with COVID, COVID yeah. Um, I guess I was. I guess I was here, and then in yeah. nineteen, yeah. when yeah. you there was the fire trucks and mm-hmm. and everything, the yeah. police dogs yeah. and yes. everything else. So, what is the family fun day? I mean, that's eleven to three p.m. Yes, free. Okay. Uh, it's it's free. It's open to the public. It's one of the few events that we have are actually open to the the public. We have events year round for foster for children that are in foster care. Um, that we don't we don't publicize those. It's private. Um, you know, we don't want people showing up with uh, you know all these kids are here enjoying their their time. Um, this is the one event that we do have that that is open to the public. It's our biggest event by far, um, and it's just it's a good time. It's for all families um, from from young youngsters to, to older ones to adults well um, we'll have a silent auction we'll still have the fire trucks we'll have the canine demonstration uh you'll see some folks from star wars out here wandering around we'll have a, a bunch of vendors that are selling you know different items and um some nonprofit organizations that are also talking about what you know the things that they do and and they'll have tables set up and all that so it's it's gonna be a lot of fun big bouncy house and big obstacle course and well, that's awesome. And for those that are coming to this, what you if you go past the fairgrounds and the golf course up on Route 178, which is uh, Crownsville Road, no, that's not Crownsville Road, uh, General General Highway, Highway yep. uh, at the light just before Lures, yes. uh, you take a left and then an immediate quick right. That's correct. So yes. you're sort of paralleling General's Highway. And then it's well marked. There are signs that have a, a blue ribbon. And it'll lead you right to right to the action. Yes. Um, yes. Tell me about some of these other events that you have with the kids, and I, I do understand the the need for them to be private. I mean, you, it's it's a huge invasion of privacy to you know, oh, there's you know that child's in foster care. Or what it's n- nobody's business. Yeah. So we'll, we'll do things. We'll have um, uh, examples movie nights. So when the weather's warmer, we have a big inflatable screen we'll set up, and um, we'll have movies and invite families over. We have um, around the holidays, so around Christmas time, we have something in the spring, a, a spring fling, if you will, uh, that. Um, the Easter Bunny comes and visits. Kids do the Easter egg hunt right here on the property of Crownsville Hospital Center, and um, they. Uh, so it's 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 things like that. We we have a we have several events each month, but it's it's to us. It's about um, for these kids to have fun, and actually enjoy their their childhood a little bit. Do they do the children in foster care? Uh, do they get support from one another? I mean, I I know that foster fam foster adults. Yes. Um, Sometimes we'll take one child. Sometimes we'll take two, three, you know, four. They, you know, whatever it may be. But do the children in foster care, especially when they come to an event here, like at the Blue Ribbon Project, do do they gain support from one another? Uh, to an extent, uh, a lot of so a lot of those families, a lot of the children may not know each other very well. Uh, but when we have those events, it's you know it could be ki- it's kids playing with kids, so they're making they are making friends, um, they're having fun together, and uh, along those lines, I don't know how much support they would they find from each other other than having fun, a little bit of moral moral support. And are they are they typically aware of what their situation is? Yes, I mean yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, yeah. When they first go into care, they're not, but over time, you know, especially when we have when we're doing events and things like that. So when the backpacks go out, that initial placement, they may not really understand. Depending on the age they don't know what's coming yeah now why i know i know when when i divorced and my kids were like oh hush hush about it and whatnot and then they realized it's like you know do you know dad there's like five other kids in my class that their parents are divorced too <laughs> and just just the fact that there was other people in this situation which seemed so foreign to my children at at the immediate time was i think a real good boost for them and some support for them as well so um that's pretty neat what does set Blue Ribbon Project apart from social services? I mean, you're not, obviously you're not going out and saying, "Okay, uh, you need you need to go live with another family." Yeah. Um, yeah. But well, I guess why doesn't social services 
do what you do? Uh, a lot of it is money and resources. Um, you know, the so Department of Social Services, they have caseworkers that just like every other agency, they're kind of overlooked or overbooked. They ha- kind of have a heavy caseload. Uh, for us, it's uh, I don't want to say it's about having fun, but it's uh, it's it's to make up you know for those areas that are lacking um, for lack of a better term. So with the events or we have a program that if we help with some scholarship stuff, but um, social services will help with a lot of that. Uh, if we have an infant that you know needs a stroller or a car seat, you know we'll ask for donations to, to purchase those items, or we'll go out and purchase them ourselves. Um, but with social services, uh, they they kind of have their job to do, and here we don't necessarily have a job. We want to kind of support the children the best that we can, give them a, that moment of hope and you know a little bit of light in their life. Taking a, you know, taking a real crappy situation and trying to make it a little bit better. Yes, yeah. that's because um, they still deserve to be kids. They don't, you know, you know. absolutely, absolutely. Um, you know, as as a retired police officer, um, I mean, you and you know, certainly the line of work that you're in now, and if you want to call it work, the line of uh, advocacy and passion that you're in, um, you've seen some pretty horrible things. Yes. Give me a great. Blue Ribbon success story. We, we can imagine um, all the all the crud in the world. Um, well, a couple of things that, that jump out um, at me is we when I first started um, the Backpacks of Love program, I didn't expect it to grow into what it did. So we had a lot of backpacks that were going out. And one of our open houses years later, um, uh, some children came up to me after we had been doing it for a few years. Some some kids came up to me and they said, "Hey, you're that backpack guy. You brought a backpack out to us," and um, and I really don't like to say it, but I didn't I didn't recognize them. We've had so many backpacks go out. I didn't really recognize the kids or you know um, they. Uh, but you know, you brought that backpack out and you, you made a difference. And so when you get to hear stories like that, especially when s- such bad stuff is happening to them, um, for them to enter foster care and then for them to say you made a difference and you know thank you for what you do, and you're hearing that from from children that, that you know it's really a, an impact uh, with that. Or you see. Um, or you follow these kids to the end if they're adopted or if they go back to the biological family and the, the, the parents um, did the things that they were supposed to do. Uh, as an example, one of the reasons why children do end up in foster care is with the opi- opioid em- sure. epidemic. Um, so let's say they, they can't really care for the children at that time. There's some neglect that's going on. Uh, oftentimes, those children will be temporarily removed from the home. But if mom and dad can get their, get, you know, get, get things together, together. And, yep, um, they can, you know, the, the kids will go back home. And it's, it's great to see them go back home. It's, you know, it's, it's one of those they don't need to ling- linger in foster care. All they want is to be with their families. So when you see that reunification happen, it's a it's a remarkable thing. And that's one thing I know my daughter has mentioned that it's, you know, no matter how crappy the situation is at home, uh, it is still home. Yes. And yes. there's a lot of resistance into foster, even though it is by the definition of a judge or a caseworker or what, you know, a better situation for the child. Uh, many children just want to go back to what they know. Yes. And uh, that's that, that's a real tough pill to swallow for, you know, somebody that's young that yeah. has no yes. idea what to do. I mean, abuse is rampant. And I, I before we started recording, I you know mentioned that, you know, I like to think that my daughter sees these horrible things down in North Carolina and I go, oh, my God, that doesn't happen here. Um, but that's just living in a in a fantasy world. And it, yeah. it does happen here. It happens uh Next door in the uh, you know, multi-million dollar homes, and it happens, uh, you know, in the public housing communities and uh, you know, schools ev- everywhere. I mean, and what advice can you give? I mean, through your experience as a you know, running the Blue Ribbon Project, as a police off former police officer, as a you know, a child that went through the foster care system, what advice do you give to somebody, an adult that suspects? child abuse or some sort of abuse because it's so difficult because i mean it's like you know i mean you've got the whole oh i don't want to narc out on my neighbor but what what if i'm wrong so and that's an excellent question because a lot of people do do think that so um mandated report is a reporting child abuse uh in the state of maryland it, it's in the, in the law that um that you need to report it to begin with if you suspect abuse you don't have to do your own investigation you don't have to 
have solid proof that something's happening. You could suspect it. And a lot of times, you know, I tell people when the when the hair on the back of your neck stands up, like something's not right here, um, you can make that report. It'll start an investigation. Um, something may come out of that investigation. Something may not. It might be something, you know, completely different as to, to what's going on. Um, oftentimes with neglect cases, uh, sometimes the family just needs support, but they don't know who to reach out to and all of that. So a neighbor calls in or somebody, a teacher calls in and says, I think these children are being neglected. Social services will work with that family, get them the resources that they, that they, uh, that they need uh, to help with that, whether it's to have the power turned back on or they need help with their rent or even purchasing clothing for, uh, for their children. Um, but it's important to make that report. Uh, like for me in my personal story, uh, I never disclosed what was going on. Even after when police and the, the social services showed up in my school, I still didn't disclose what was going on to me. But it was a, um, well, I don't know for certain. I, I'm only guessing based on the, on the questions, but I do believe it was a waitress at the Denny's on West Street that suspected something was going on and made that call. And the only reason why I suspect that is um you know, she asked me a lot of weird questions and stuff like that, that, that I thought didn't occur to me at the time. Um, but I could even be wrong about that. It could have been a teacher. Uh, there is, there are ways to remain anonymous. Now the social services will have your name, but we don't go to the family and say, Hey, Mrs. Jones next door. Thanks. Th yeah. <laughs> Thanks. You're hurting your kids. Well, do you work with the, uh, I mean, I, I'm assuming social services also works with the, uh, Crisis response team yes, of the CIT, yes, and I mean yes. that. Again, th you mentioned that it, it may just be a matter of neglect, where they don't know where to reach out for the resources. Exactly. And I imagine as our Hispanic population is growing yes. in the area, uh, we've got a language barrier. And I know someone had told me one time that uh, of the, it was it's like sixty percent of the Spanish or the Hispanic population of Annapolis High School's parents have never been in the school um, for. Various reasons. I mean, it could be an undocumented issue, uh, but more likely than not, it's a, uh, a language barrier. And they yes. don't realize that the resources are that we can, you know, if you want to come in and speak tag along, they're going to find some way to to, to translate it. For yes, you. yes. Um, and it's important for those parents to be involved in their children's lives and, and their schooling. And, um, you yeah, know, that's super important. But that is a, you know, a big thing, the language barrier. But there are resources out there that can help with that. Uh, another thing that we've seen in the Hispanic community is they want to make a report um, and they're afraid to because they think if they make that report, all of a sudden they're going to be deported or somebody, you know, in my 20 years as a police officer, I've never asked anybody what their legal status was. And I, I really don't care if they're a victim of a crime. I'm going to help them out. They're not going to get deported for making a report. Um, and that that goes outside of child abuse. You see it with robberies and, and, and all those other crimes are scared to report them uh, because they think they're going to get deported. And that's not that's not the case. And it's important for you know people to understand that and realize that. You know, that if they're a victim of a crime or they suspect abuse is going on, make that phone call. Yeah, the, poli the police are going to stay in their lane. The fire department's going to stay in their lane. The schools are going to stay in their lane. You know, they're, yeah. that's their focus. I'm yeah. focused on keeping you safe. I'm not burning your house down and giving you medical attention and teaching you. Yes. And that's yes. pretty much where it is. Um, what What do you give, what kind of advice or what what to an older child that may think that, you know, you know my dad or my mom is hitting me or, you know, I... I why don't why don't we have any food? I mean, it, and that's got to be very difficult. I mean, you know, you're a child really doesn't know that they're tattling, if you will, yeah. on their parents. But I mean, how do the, what do you say to a child that is in a bad situation that realizes they're in a bad situation? Um, talk about it. Um, talk about it. So most children will have a trusted adult, whether it's a, a parent of a friend, whether it's a teacher that they have a good relationship with. You know, talk to that trusted person about it. Uh, as to what's going on, whether it's physical abuse, whether it's uh, unfortunately a, a sex offense, or if the family just needs help, you know, hey, Mrs. Jones, I'm not getting enough food at home. And, you know, I'm hungry. It may not be neglect, but that family needs some help. So uh, just encourage them to, to to talk to somebody about what's going on, what's going on in their life. Um, one of the things that really frustrated me as a, as a detective in a lot of the child abuse cases was the... Uh, a report would be made and then you're talking to the child or you're talking to witnesses and, they, and the child says, well, this has been going on for, for years now. I just never told anybody or a neighbor or a teacher or who, whoever's in that child's life uh, will tell me, I suspected something was going on a long time ago, but I wasn't sure about it or I didn't know if I needed to make a report or, or what have you. Um, so then you find out that years have gone by or a long period of time has gone by where that child has you know sustained injury or um, has suffered through abuse or neglect 
but that report was never made. So by the time the police are getting the call, the call oftentimes it's been going on for a while. Um, early intervention is, is the key. Yeah, and I imagine also when it's been going on for a while then, I mean, that it almost normalizes the behavior for in the eyes of a child. Yeah. Uh, this is, you know, I mean, you mean when you spill the milk, you you don't get, you know, slapped and locked under the, you know, yeah, under the steps yeah. or whatever it may be. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that that's just the way it is in their house, and yes. they get they get used to that. Do you have any, you know, based on your professional experience, personal experience, and certainly you know what you've got here, um, is there just some just so sobering, sobering statistic for Anne Arundel County? Yep. So that's you know. So just to kind of give you an idea, um, and not just Anne Arundel County, but in our last fiscal year, uh, we served, so Backpacks of Love, just the program Backpacks of Love, kids that are going to foster care, we served 759 children. Um, not all of those were Anne Arundel County, um, but you would be surprised if the number of children that are being abused or, or, or sex abuse. Um, and when it comes to like what's reported to the police department, uh, a lot of neglect isn't reported to the police. With with neglect, uh, it's a lot of times those families are are they need resources, they need some help, things like that. Um, but the things that do get reported is um, child sex offenses as well as physical abuse. And the number of sex offenses that occur that are reported is significantly higher than than physical abuse cases. A lot of people, when they think of child abuse, they think of you know, striking a child or, or physical, uh, but a majority of it is actually a, a child sex offense uh, where, where you have you know, child victims with that. Um, so I don't have the numbers in front of me, but, the, the, you know, the sex offenses are significantly higher than the physical abuse. Wow. So and the, the problem with sex offenses is oft, oftentimes they're what we call late reported. So um, little Susie may have been molested between the time she was five and seven years old, but she may not talk about it until she's 14, 15, or even an adult if she talks about it at all. Uh, so a lot of times it's like one in four uh, people are the victim of a, of a sex offense. So if you're, you're seeing that with the, with the Catholic church right now with everything, you know, you, a lot of the adults that are coming out that it's been, you know, repressed or that's the way that they dealt with yes. whatever it may be. And now they're saying, Hey, this is, um, you know, me too. Yes. 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 Um, Wow. So, I mean, the sex events is probably yes up there. Wow. What's the future look like for the Blue Ribbon Project? Um, Keep doing what we're doing. Um, I'd I'd like to expand in some more counties in Maryland. I'd like to uh, uh, come up with a few more programs so we can better serve the youth that we that we have. We have some really good programs going, and uh, when I've when I've developed different programs, it was based on need. There's a gap. Somebody needs to, to meet that need. So we would you know, come up with a program to, to do that. So, you know, as an example, the Backpacks of Love program is, you know, those kids don't have anything when they're going into care. I saw that need there. The system has changed uh, significantly since I was in care. The uh, system has gotten much, much better. But the one thing that isn't going to change is the condition that the child is in going into foster care where they don't have anything. So nothing's going to change with that. Um, so we saw that gap and decided to... Uh, do that. So all our programs come about that. So if there's any additional programs uh, that we can do, um, we'll, we'll come up with that. Um, our biggest thing, and my biggest thing, is I'm really big on volunteerism. Uh, I really love having volunteers come in and work with us. So if you're looking for a vo- volunteer opportunity, love to expand our volunteer program. Um, you know, get involved. Uh, you know, sometimes it's working with these kids. Sometimes it's building the backpacks of love. It's sorting donations that come in. Uh, it's a it's a variety of things. So I really like to build that up as well. You know, I was sitting here scribbling down, and when somebody is brought into foster care again in the middle of the day or something like that, and uh, with what the Backpacks of Love does bring, for those that are trying to imagine this, uh, you at any given point in the day, you might have nine items of clothing on you. Two socks, two shoes, pants, underwear, T-shirt, shirt, maybe an overcoat. Yes. That's it. That's it. That's that 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 for all intents and purposes are my worldly possessions at yes. that moment. Yes, yep, that is very true. Um, if you happen to be home, and if you were to have a little bit more, um, oftentimes it's thrown in a trash bag, and you know those are th- those belongings are. You know, those are those kids' possessions. They're not. It's not trash. It doesn't belong in a trash bag. Um, so, our like our backpacks, they're they're new backpacks. They 
they're not labeled or branded with the Blue Ribbon Project, so there's no way to tell that they're in foster care. It looks like a standard backpack. Um, you know, we had some backpacks that went out last night, as I'd mentioned. You know, we got, we got a late call. Um, there was um, a thing. One of the backpacks was frozen. Another one was Mickey Mouse, and um, the other one was just kind of kind of plain. But just to give you an idea what the backpacks are, um, and that's all new stuff that, that that's going to going to that child. That's great. That's great. Are there any other organizations like the Blue Ribbon Project around the country? Um, or is the Blue Ribbon Project looking to move across maybe, the country? Uh, I'd love to expand it if I could, um, especially now that I've retired, got a little mm-hmm. bit more time on my hands. So uh, I'd love to expand it and, and, and try to go nationwide. Uh, but our, our, our primary focus is here in Anne Arundel County in the, in the city of Annapolis. Perhaps the most important question I got for you as we start to wrap up, how can we help? So, uh, like I said, I'm really big on volunteerism, uh, volunteer, you know, some time, come in, down, come, come down, sort some donations and all of that. Uh, we do need items for our backpacks of love program. We also need back, um, items for our, for Mira's closet. Uh, so I tell people, you know, we, the biggest thing for us is donations. So if you're in, Target and you see a perfect pair of kids pajamas that are in the clearance aisle for, you know, a few dollars, pick them up. Those are perfect for us. You don't have to go build a big back, you know, a whole backpack. Um, it can be a toothbrush. It can be some toothpaste. It can be some articles of clothing, you know, just to be out shopping, you know, for your own kids, you know, just pick up a couple extra items and then you can donate them to us. Uh, we also do have a lot of organizations that, that get together as well as families that get together and, and build complete backpacks. So they'll call us up and say, we you know, we built these backpacks um, and we'll coordinate with them and, and drop them off. We do have a um, list on our website of what goes into each and every backpack. So if you want to build a backpack for that seven-year-old girl, Girl, there's a little checklist and you can print it out, check it off, build the backpack and then uh, uh, donate the backpack. Or if you want to build a backpack that just has some clothing in it and that's it or just has toothbrush, toothpaste, we have some donations on the shelves here. We'll, we'll fill up the, the remainder of it. Is there a way to donate 24-7? Is there like a bin or? So if you, it's, it's a little difficult to find, but if you come to our, our location at 45 Community Place in, in Crownsville, uh, you'll see a sign that says admin offices. If you follow that around, we do have a donation bin um, kind of on, on the, the front side of our building uh, for people to drop those those items off. Or they can make they can call and make an appointment. They can buy during the day when we have volunteers here. Um, you can also, if you want to donate financially, which is always appreciated, uh, we can go to our website at Blue project.org and, and and donate there. We are a 501c3, so there are some 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 tax. And I do encourage everybody to do that and give in whichever way you can, whether you can volunteer your time as a uh, as a volunteer or whether you've got, got some spare money to you know to give to the organization. Or uh, as you said, it's real easy if you're in in Target or Walmart or the Giant or you know just yeah. pick up a spare toothbrush. Yes, exactly. And bring it on up here to Crownsville. It's uh, I, I still am blown away by that 759 yeah. kids that you worked with. Yeah. And uh, it's a real problem. And it's uh, it's a problem that's not going away anytime soon, yeah. unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, although I'd love to turn around and say, okay, well, Taylor, you, you're now unemployed. Go find something else to do yes. in your, yes. <laughs> your retirement. Yeah. Find a beach in Tahiti or something like that. But it's not going to happen. Um Thank you for what you're doing. Thank you uh, certainly for your service as a uh, police officer for your 20 years in the area and also for you know what you're doing and advocating for the kids. And I think it's so important uh, that you, you can tell that it's not just an idea and a thought and something that you want to do because, I mean, you're, you're a product of the of the system and uh, you're you're doing this on passion. And that totally is is evident. So um Thank you, everybody. BlueRibbonProject.org is where you want to go. Find out all the great things that they are doing. If you can volunteer, there's opportunities for you. You can certainly donate, uh, whether it be goods or uh, money. And let's do what we can to you know, make the life of a kid that's in a, pardon the language, but a shitty situation a little bit better. Yeah. Thanks for listening to this week's Local Business Spotlight. Please make sure to visit ionanapolis.net for all your local news, events, and opinion. And in case you haven't already, please subscribe to the Ion Annapolis Daily News Brief, where we bring you all the day's local news direct to your phone, tablet, or computer in about 10 minutes. 
It comes to you at 6 a.m. every Monday through Friday. And you can subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts.